710 podcast. This week's guest is Yanni Botsford, is Yanni Botsford Architects, a small factory face in London, well known for their luxurious private homes, not only in London, but across the world. Thank you for joining us, Yanni. Uh, the first question I'd like to ask you today is, what's the experience of having your work not only nominated for awards, but appear on the telly? That must be quite a shock to, I don't know. That's certainly why I've first seen your project, and what do you think of the, the idea that, uh, that this generation of architects in mind like, grew up on grand designs and other such like, shows, and, you know, that's how a lot of students skin to they go, oh, I want to be Kim that's not really how it turns out, but... I mean, the problem with most of those programmes is they don't generally support the architect, no. I find, grand designs. I think that this was a slightly different programme done by grand designs with mm-hmm. Kevin MacLeod, supporting actually built projects. And did, know, did you feel that he knew his stuff when you met him, or was it? It was interesting. He did know, and he had done done his research, but he also quite enjoyed, he told me he enjoyed the process of that filming, because he didn't have to, as he said, kind of sit in a field with muddy boots and That's true. go through the whole process of construction. He was just enjoying the finished buildings. So it's quite a different experience for him. Must be annoying. See, if um, he'll, he'll know a lot about architecture, you would assume to have to maybe chum up a project that he maybe doesn't like so much. Well, okay. I don't know if he liked it. He said he liked it. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. No, no, don't take it personal. I was just. I was just a thought. But I mean, it was it was an interesting experience to do it and to try and explain it and not let it kind of get dumbed down in a way. I tried to keep steering the conversation back to what I thought was important about the project we built. Um, and I think you know they're always looking for something else to say other than what you might want to say about it. it was it quite an enjoyable experience to? go back to the project and just have a look at it again again I'm sure you look at your projects um, often enough but yeah look at I it mean, maybe a different sort of mind of you know you're maybe you're trying to sell it once it's done almost yeah I mean I've had to do that quite a lot with that project and take people around so that aspect of it wasn't unusual but having Kevin kind of looking at it in a different way was interesting asking different questions about it I think he was kind of interested in the poetry of the project and how light worked in the space. Mm-hmm. He wanted to understand that better. And I think the kind of surprise in that house is that you go down two floors and there's still daylight kind of 10 metres on the mm-hmm. ground. Yeah, it's a very, very beautiful house. I've seen that project on, on Dazeen and that question I'd like to ask people is what their thoughts on sites like Arc Daily, Dazeen, maybe even a modern house even. Um, replacing the place, uh, uh, replacing magazines and replacing books for this generation of students. You know these um, these students look at press and they'll just Google on Pinterest mm. building with concrete or whatever. You know, mm. um, and that's I don't know just your thoughts on that. Whether often yeah, I think it, there are good and bad things about that. I mean, the kind of immediacy is a good thing, but it's also a problem in that everything is just having a very quick look at something and not proper in depth. Mm-hmm read about it or understand the background about it or understanding about the architecture or the architect behind it. So there is that danger that it's very kind of superficial. At the same time, there's an awful lot of access to architecture constantly, which can, again, have good or bad things about it because people might take aspects of a project without really understanding them properly. That seems to be the common sort of answer that just because it's on there doesn't mean it's good, you yeah. know. You know, just because a certain type of facade you like doesn't mean that it will work, whatever. And I don't know, it's a, it's a, it seems like a difficult thing, how do you get people back into the library, other than until the later years when you have to start doing large pieces of writing? You know, is it just about curation of these websites? Um, I mean, I'm just always surprised how little there is of that that goes on with students when I'm teaching. They don't seem that aware of architecture out there. And they don't spend time sitting in the library looking no. through magazines and books. I definitely spent my time doing when I was a student, and I found it really rewarding and important. And I kind of look forward to a new, you know, magazine coming out once a month or whatever. Yeah, they are croquets and such things. Yeah. Or yeah. these things don't, you know, we have maybe the architects journals, maybe the sort of closest in between we get. But uh, speaking as a student and uh, knowing that everyone else, it's design, it's art daily, it's where you can have the most range you can go. Yeah. And yet, it's a tough thing to counteract, I suppose. I don't, I don't really know what we'll do with it. But you do have a library here. with. Of course, yeah. Everyone yeah. everyone has libraries. And as as you progress further, you go, I like Zoom 4, I want to read about Zoom 4. You like, it's a hat either. Whoever, you know. But yeah. certainly, if you're going for a little thing, you're going, I want to make a CLT building. And you're trying to figure out the detail. You type in CLT building. And 
But I think that, comes up. That, that is useful. I mean, it's incredible to be able to do that mm -hmm. quickly um, and find out all sorts of different ways of tackling a problem and using a material. So that can be very helpful. I, think. I mean, there's also the advantage of the, the internet is just the amount of things we can learn at speed. You know, if you want to learn how to use Rhino, Google, and it teaches you. Yeah. And that's how I learned to use Rhino in the past month. I was just, you know, no one had taught me. And, yeah, the, the, the availability of information is huge, but I guess the curation is maybe needs some work on it, but I don't know whether they'll. Well, I think that aspect of it is really interesting as well. Young people now aren't scared of technology and aren't scared of learning new skills and don't see it as a kind of problem to overcome. Mm -hmm. They just, as you say, just look it up on YouTube and follow a video that somebody's put out there learn how to do something new. And have you noticed, how have you adapted to that? Obviously, you maybe got taught at a time where I'm sure there was some sort of computer availability, but, you know, as your practice has progressed, have you just tried to learn that yourself and keep up with it, or is it, how did your original training no, adapt to it? I've gone, I would say, backwards in the use of computers. Really? I'm going to talk about that tonight, but I mean, I was working with computers 25 years ago at the AA in a unit that was um, focused on the use of computers in architecture very, mm -hmm. very early on. So this is before well, the internet just starting, kind of before email and um, before all sorts of things that we're used to now. And I was actually writing computer code oh, really? to generate architecture. Yeah. So, but what I can't do it anymore. What was the software? That was Autolisp, so I was writing in, in a... Um, language within AutoCAD. Oh, okay, kind of like a basic version of what Grasshopper may be or something like that. Well, it's what Grasshopper, those kind of things have become, but Grasshopper yeah. is much simpler to use. So mm -hmm. Much um, more user-friendly. Yeah. yeah, much more user-friendly. So, that you know, the good thing about that is people are more willing to try it and use it. They're not scared of it and mm -hmm. actually pick it up quickly. Yeah, it was extremely hard to use those tools when we were using them. And was there anyone to teach you at that time, or was it just... Not really, it was just... just the thing all, existed and... The students all taught each other. That was the kind of most interesting thing, is we all helped each other. Yeah. I mean, there's a scene as an ex exciting thing that these things were coming out. Where, where, whereas, you know, I, I, throughout my university education, Rhino and Revit have all existed, and I'm, you know, I've kind of been, I don't know, it doesn't seem something new. You know, was there an excitement to it, or was it just... Oh, it was very exciting, yeah, of course. Um, and I think there was a lot of interest in it, and that work has become very valid, and... You know, we've used it in my practice ever since then. It's become the kind of backbone of the way we do approach. But you project. try to uh, avoid using it yourself. Well, I've got people in my office. <laughs> that must have been it. So you know, it's knowing knowing what it can do, what its possibilities are, mm -hmm. is the most important thing, rather than necessarily me being able to do it myself. And do you find that you've taught and teach? Um, that your students are kind of glued to the computer. I know that's something our thesis uh, tutor is always getting on of us, is get out of the screen, you're slowing yourself down. Um, is that something that you find with your students, or is there anything that you try to, anything that constantly comes up? Well, we are trying to get them to use tools like Grasshopper mm -hmm. in a specific way in the projects we're developing. But at the same time, we're trying to get them to get out of that and work with real things and make models and use real materials and test things at one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So we're interested in the kind of balance between the two and kind of forcing that balance to happen, not allowing it just to be in the computer, but actually taking a step out of that every now and then and let it kind of reinform what you might be doing in the computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, stop people getting stuff. Is there something that you find with architecture students that you're you know, a consistent message you're trying to convey, you know, a constant a thing you're you're always trying to get to them, you know? My biggest problem is getting them to be willing to be experimental. Really? Mm -hmm. You're afraid that they, do they find themselves stuck in their first idea? I think they're stuck in how they've been taught before and what they think their future is going to be. Mm -hmm. And we're trying to kind of get them to think differently. How do, you, how do you do that? What's the secret? Well, I'm not quite sure, but <laughs> we start from very first principles, um, understanding climate, understanding context by kind of physically measuring it, making things a one-to-one, -one, building structures that react to the context in a specific way, and using that way of looking as a way then to develop a project. So we talk a lot about not designing, Okay. 
and allowing a project to emerge through the process of research and uh, investigation. And the hope that something obvious will appear in. You know, that's the... the yeah, I mean, obvious, it, yeah. obvious in a sense, in that it's the right answer. Yeah. That's definitely an aim, yeah. So, teaching people not to design is quite hard. I, I can't imagine how long we do that. <laughs> um, it's a good skill, though. <laughs> stumped you, haven't I? Um, you have a variety of projects throughout the globe. What's your experience on working on different sites, different contractors, different regulations? Is there is there something you do to help yourself embed into different uh, surroundings, I suppose, beyond London? I mean, each time it's a completely different problem we've found. Mm -hmm. You think there might be a kind of consistent way you might approach dealing with a different context, but there isn't. So some are more sophisticated, some are less sophisticated, some are cheaper, some are more expensive, some you can get local consultants mm -hmm. and help, some you can't. So, you know, the project in Costa Rica, they couldn't even read drawings. Really? So, in the end, we realised what we had to do is make a model, at a kind of, I think we made a 1 to 20 model, and took it out there and said, we want this model, but bigger over there. And, you what and, one, and you know, and then we made models of every single junction. Oh wow! And it was kind of really interesting because they just suddenly understood what the project was about, and they'd been baffled up until then. And that taught me quite a lot, you know, that you have to really think carefully about who you're dealing with when you're in a different context mm -hmm. and what their skills are. And be open. And to it's it. not that they couldn't build it. Yeah. It's just they couldn't build it with the information we were providing them. And then. In the Bahamas, for instance, that's you know everything that went wrong could go wrong, and that we were told that from the beginning that will happen. But it's it's definitely true. Just an accepted fact. Yeah. Because of I'm assuming the pipelines or whatever. I don't know. I mean, there's the weather and the culture, the politics. So it kind of went on and on. Did it make it seem the building in London a bit benign, or was London a bit? I'm well, it's very nice working somewhere where you understand what's going to happen next, mm -hmm. pretty much. So, I think, you know, in these foreign projects, you don't know what's going to happen next, and you have to just kind of keep being active. And is there an element of faith that when you fly back to this country, is it just, I hope everyone else is going okay over there, do you? Or is yeah, it... I mean, obviously, you have to trust the people around you and trust the people you've employed to work on things. I mean, some projects, I think, maybe, in hindsight, we could have had more presence mm -hmm. if we even had a site architect. Oh, okay. So there's a project in Sardinia we're hoping to do where actually part of the contract is there will be a site architect the whole time just to deal with these problems. Little bits and bobs. Yeah. And was it a goal to have these projects throughout the world or is it just a ha happy No, concept? I mean, not. it wasn't something I kind of sought to do. Um, but it is interesting and it is kind of the approach to architecture we take is to understand these different contexts and treat them kind of almost blind start with and then look at them carefully to, to let the project kind of emerge through that process. So, that's interesting. Um, you advertise a lot of competition work on your website. Is that something that's important to you to keep not only doing conceptual work but um, to just to develop the practice as its own, you know, even if the competitions don't go through? Yeah, I mean, we do them to win them. Mm -hmm, of we course, yeah. To have them won very many. Um, but it's a way of looking at new programs that we're not necessarily commissioned to do mm -hmm. and looking at ways of kind of moving, you know, different sectors. So that's interesting. And um, it's, yes, it becomes um, a tool in the office to develop different concepts. And do you find it's good for office morale and an excitement yeah, of doing a little fun I project? Think, I think people enjoy it. Um, but it, it's it's very hard work and it's kind of demoralising when <laughs> two hundred fifty people enter a competition and you know the, the amount of work people do is is kind of out of proportion really. The amount of money lost there. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we went to the competition where we worked out everybody had entered had spent more than the construction budget of the project. I think it was like a million pound project. That's bonkers. Yeah, and it just makes no sense. We could have just written a check. And sent it off, and it would pay for the building. You know, if every practice had just done that instead of actually. But that's not really the point. I think 
Do you think it's the way it works and it's the way of being able to move on to different scale projects? You know, a competition we did win in China has led to a 42 story tower being built, which is on the site at the moment. Amazing, yeah. So that's not something we would have got here. We wouldn't be given the chance to do that. So you think competition should still exist even if there's I'm money going against, down the drain? I'm not against competitions. I just think they need to be well run and properly thought through. And maybe a, a limit to entrance, perhaps? Maybe, but then that doesn't allow the kind of wild card That's true, yeah. architect to win a project. So I'm not, no, I'm not so convinced by that. Okay. okay. Well, the last question I'd like to ask and the question I ask all our guests is, any recommendations for an architect's grand tour? A lot of us are going out to their part one placements or they're going in a year out. Where would you recommend when we go travelling that somewhere maybe off the beaten track path? Um, well, I would encourage a young architect to look at vernacular architecture. Mm -hmm. Go to Iceland and look at the sod houses or go to Africa and look at mud houses or, you know, look at the really kind of the buildings that are really in tune with their context and climate and have reacted over the centuries to that to develop something, you know, incredibly sophisticated mm. that works. Is that well. something you've done yourself? Have you gone to these places? Yes. And I've, I usually take us, I've never taken my students to look at buildings that are, you know, designed buildings. We've mm. only ever looked at either nature vernacular, yeah. or vernacular architecture. Um, we've been to Libya, Morocco, uh, Ghana, Iceland. All sorts of places like that, and we always look at the local techniques for mm -hmm. construction and materials and vernacular architecture, and then we look at nature to understand very closely what's happening in that context and that climate. That's interesting. Well, thank you, Johnny, for joining us this week. Our next guest will be Heather Dumbledam of Dumbledam Architecture, so make sure you tune in for that. Thank you.